I'd like to introduce Dr. Chris Brown. He's a senior lecturer and researcher with the Australian Rivers Institute at Griffith University. Chris uh, works on conservation of marine ecosystems and sustainable management of fisheries. He is equally passionate about the marvellous diversity of the natural world and statistics and combines his research, uh, combines these two passions in his research. He uses, uses advanced statistical techniques to bring ecological complexity to the planning tools used to inform decision makers. His latest project, the Global Wetlands Program, brings together an international team to map the status of coastal wetland habitats and provide a blueprint for their conservation. I'm now going to hand over to Chris and he will share his, power, his presentation and I'll leave it over to him. Thank you very much, Chris. Hello everyone, thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, just setting up my, get the right screen up, there we go. Oh, so thanks for the introduction, uh, Damien. So our coasts are really places of change. They sit at the intersection of two biomes of land and sea. So they bring together a huge diversity of different life forms. And they're also hubs of human activity. So 10% of humanity live within 10 vertical metres of sea level and 40% of, of people live near the coast. So this intense use of the coastal zone for shipping and fishing, and recreation and mining and all the other things we do puts immense pressure on coastal ecosystems. And it can also create conflicts among the different values that people hold for the coast. Uh, so in today's talk, I want to give three case studies for sharks, shrimp and seagrass. And in each case study, I'll discuss how conflicts occur when different people hold different values for nature. And how I also want to discuss how our differing values lead to conflicting approaches to managing these ecosystems. Um, and for sharks, I will show how these conflicts can be quite obvious, but we have struggled to resolve them. Then I'll discuss examples of shrimp and seagrass when conflicts in human values happen, even though we might not realise it. And one of the reasons for these challenges is that ecosystems are highly connected across land and sea. So impacts in one place can have cascading effects elsewhere. Um, and so recognising these conflicts is a first step towards greater harmony of people's many activities on the coast and nature. Um, so throughout this talk, I talk about some of our published research and also other people's published research. So feel free to follow up with me if you'd like to know more about that. And I've also included the, the references on the paper for the scientists that are here. Um, and I'd just like to acknowledge our, our funding for this work. So this, this presentation covers quite a lot of different projects, um, including the Global Wetlands Project, um, projects funded by the Australian Research Council and work funded by the National Environmental Science Program. So onto my first case study of sharks. And this is really about a conflict between conservation values um, beach safety and fishing. But before I talk about um, the conflict, I just wanted to convince you that sharks are incredible animals. So just think about it. They've been around for hundreds of millions of years and they even survived the mass extinction that wiped out the dinosaurs. Um, and they're also really important players in coastal ecosystems. Some sharks can even help out seagrass, which we'll hear about later on in this talk. But the cool fact I want to give you is, is one that you might not have heard before, and that's that sharks um, some types of sharks are really smart uh, and like people, sharks that care for their young better turn out that those shark species are also the smarter shark species. Um, so my friend and, and collaborator Chris Mole sent me this picture of a, a shark brain and a hammerhead shark. And so he looked at a whole huge range of different types of sharks that have different types of parental care. So some sharks just provide their embryos with an egg yolk and so that the babies don't get as much energy. Whereas in other sharks, the mother even has a type of placenta like mammals, uh, and that feeds the embryos in the womb. Some sharks even have a type of reproduction called adelophagy, which means that the siblings actually cannibalize each other inside the womb. And what Chris found is that shark species that provide more nutrients to their babies are smarter and have bigger brains. Um, and that's just because it takes more energy to grow a brain, even if that energy does come from eating your brother. Um, so despite their intelligence, and the fact they survived the extinction of dinosaurs, many shark species today are declining and some are even threatened with extinction. And in fact, Australia is a hot spot for threatened sharks. So we're really you know, looking after a lot of these threatened species. Um, and sharks are threatened for a number of reasons, but largely because people like to eat them or catch them for their fins for soup. 
um, or we just catch them accidentally when we're trying to catch other fish like tuna, or we're worried about shark bites, so we cull them. So here's my first conflict on the coast. Many Australians love and respect sharks, but we're also deliberately culling threatened shark species. So on one hand, we're listing sharks on endangered species lists, and we have strict regulations on commercial fisheries that help to avoid them catching too many sharks. But some people are also claiming we need more shark culls because a plague of sharks on the east coast of Australia is causing increasing bites on swimmers. So we wanted to look at whether this plague of sharks was actually happening and what the what the evidence said about the plague of sharks. Um, so in Queensland, we have the shark control program, which is nets and drum lines, um, and they're there to catch sharks and to try and prevent large sharks from encountering, encountering swimmers. And so that program has been happening since um, the late 1950s and catch records go back to the 1960s. Um, so that gives us a lot of data to actually look at how many sharks there used to be in the water back to the 1960s. Another neat thing about the um, shark control program from a science perspective is it covers quite a large area of the coast. So it goes all the way from Cairns down to the Gold Coast. So it gives us quite a large uh, area covered um, from which we can get data and look at large scale trends in sharks rather than just localised trends in shark populations. Another really important thing about that data from a science perspective uh, is that we often don't have data on ecological baselines. So very often we start monitoring ecosystems after they're already in decline. It's very rare that we have, for instance, data on fish catches before industrial fishing really took off in the 60s and 70s. So this is a really unique data set that lets us look back a long time um, and understand how many sharks used to be in the ocean. So what we found looking back to the 1960s is that on Queensland's coast, shark, large sharks have been in decline. And in fact, very far, we're very far from a plague. It's quite the opposite. We're losing our large sharks. Uh, so tiger sharks we found declined 74%. Uh, hammerheads and, and white sharks, which are, um, include species that are listed as threatened species, were declined by a massive 92%. Uh, and so, um, these declines across so many species uh, and across such a large area, such a long time period, suggest you know, there's something going on that's affecting all sharks, not just a few sharks locally. Uh, and so I have to acknowledge my colleague, uh, George Roth, who, who led this work on the, on the shark analysis. And another interesting point was that tiger sharks have also declined, which, which surprised us, because tiger sharks are known to be pretty good breeders of, of all these large sharks. Mothers can have more than 30 pups in the years when they breed. So then we wanted to know, of course, OK, now we've established they're declining. There's not a plague. So why are they declining? Um, so we consider a number of different causes. One could just be data issues. So I put dolphins here because um, some people have said that dolphins are poaching um, bait off the shark drum lines and therefore the drum lines are catching fewer sharks. But that can't really explain uh, declines over such a large spatial region and over such a long period of time because you know, that, that theory relies on dolphins localised learning this behaviour. Um, another cause could be climate change, but uh, on Queensland's coast, historically at least, climate change hasn't been a big player in, in driving ecosystem change. So into the future, you know, since the, the, the massive heat wave we've seen recently and into the future, climate change will be a big player, but historically going back to the 1960s, there hasn't been a huge amount of warming. It could also be that the prey fish that, that your shark species decline on have changed, uh, but we don't think that's the case. Um, we don't have any strong evidence for changes in prey fish, and also we're talking about a large number of different large shark species that have quite varied diets. So it'd be surprising that prey fish would cause all of these different species to decline when, when they have such different habits. Um, so that really only leaves the other, uh, other main cause that, that could cause these declines is fishing. And you know, fishing is the likely culprit because we know from around the world that fishing is causing declines in, in large shark species. The problem here is, and the, the problem we, we still yet to answer, is what type of fishing is, is contributing most to these declines. So people catch a lot of these sharks recreationally um, or accidentally. They're caught as bycatch in some commercial fisheries locally, and some commercial fisheries also target coastal sharks, but not particularly the species we studied. Uh, and they're also caught in international fisheries. So a lot of the these large shark species can roam over huge different distances. So tiger sharks have been tracked moving to um, Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. So they could also be caught in fisheries there. But what we do know is that the shark and program control program itself, the place where we got the data, catches a lot of sharks as well. Um, 
So that's hardly helping these trends that, that that program is catching so many sharks. So um, what can we do about this conflict? We seemingly have a conflict between uh, uh, protecting bathers on beaches and um, conserving these large shark species. And part of the problem is that um, we've been making this debate about sharks versus pe people, and particularly in the media, this is how it plays out. But in fact, when people of a, a communities are surveyed independently, there's very little support for lethal shark control. So in the hotspot of, of shark bites, Ballina, this survey found that only 15% of people supported lethal shark control. Um, so I think in general, our communities understand that this is a much more nuanced debate and, and complicated issue than just sharks versus people, and they would like to see uh, better compromised um, solutions made for this. And there's a lot of great emerging technologies that can help us reconcile this apparent conflict and perhaps find a better com um, compromise. So for instance, I put a picture of a drone here, which they're now using drones in parts of Australia to, to um, survey waters for sharks and alert swimmers when a, a large shark might be, be nearby. So I think if we keep looking to the future, we can um, create a win-win situation where beaches are safer for people, but we still have conservation of these large sharks. So moving to my next case study, um, which is about prawns. So I'm a bit sheepish here because I did take some literary license and I just thought it would sound better to call my talk sharks, shrimp and seagrass. But I'm actually going to talk about prawns. So shrimp is a North American word for prawns and in Australia we call them prawns, as you're probably all familiar with. Uh, and the conflict here is really between agricultural development and fisheries. So we're going to look at the northern prawn trawl fishery. So that fishery operates across the north coast of Australia, including in the Gulf of Carpentaria. Uh, and it catches multiple different species of prawns that you, you know, commonly see in the supermarkets here. Uh, it's very valuable, one of Australia's most valuable fisheries, has a revenue of about $100 million per year. Uh, and one of the key species that, that's most popular for our barbecues is the banana prawn. Banana prawn are caught well out into the Gulf of Carpentaria, so they you know, we catch them in the ocean. So you might be surprised to hear that their life cycle actually depends on natural river flow and having fresh water around. So let me tell you a bit about the banana prawns life cycle. Um, they spawn out in the Gulf of Carpentaria and then their larvae make their way by tides and currents uh, back into estuaries where they um, settle and, and hide in the in vegetated habitats and or mud flats there. So when they're in the estuaries, they grow very quickly because there's a lot of food for them. Uh, but they're also getting eaten by a lot of predators. So the, the rate of mortality or the, the rate that they die is very, very high in those estuaries, just because there's so many fish trying to eat prawns. Um, and the prawns stay in the estuaries and keep getting eaten unless they get pushed out into the ocean. So they need these fresh water flows to push them out into the ocean. Uh, and that really cues them and tells them, well, I've got to ride this, um, this plume out into the ocean. And then they, once they're out in the ocean, they'll grow up into big prawns and they can spawn new uh, baby prawns and also be caught in the fishery. So fresh water flow is a really important part of their life cycle. And these flows are really common in the wet season of the north. Um, and obviously it's important as well for the fishery that they get pushed out offshore because we can't fish too close to the shore just because it's too shallow. Uh, and so this fishery is actually one of the world's most effectively managed fisheries. So the fishing activity itself is quite sustainable and it's been you know, very profitable fishery over a large number of years because of that excellent management. So the conflict we have here is actually an emerging one. There are plans now to build massive dams in Northern Australia. And these dams are there, they, people want to put them there because they provide, may provide new economic opportunities for farming. So during Tony Abbott's days as PM, you may have heard the government talk about the potential for the North to be the food bowl of Asia. So we would need these dams to feed that food bowl with water. Um, dams obviously prevent water flowing downstream to estuaries uh, and in fact you know dams are so important to human economies that there are very few rivers globally that don't have some sort of dam weir or flow modification in place. Um, so rivers like in the Gulf that aren't dammed or have very little modification are sort of globally outstanding examples of natural rivers with natural flows where ecological processes uh, and human uses of those have been preserved over very long time periods. Um, and dams are obviously a disaster for freshwater organisms because they prevent the migration of freshwater fish and so on. Um, so we wanted to know if these proposed dams may also influence prawns because they need that freshwater flow to push them out of the ocean. And we think we chose prawns because there's good data on them 
Uh, but they're also an important indicator species for other species that could be impacted in estuaries, like barramundi and endangered sawfish. Um, and also an indicator perhaps for some of the important indigenous cultural values. Um, for instance, a lot of indigenous food sources like turtles and magpie geese also rely on these freshwater flows. So I have to acknowledge my student Andrew Broadley here who, who led this work. Um, and along with our collaborators, we conducted an analysis to study the relationship between historical catch of banana prawns and river flow. Uh, and so this map here shows um, the Gulf of Carpentaria and those black dots just show where they're, you know, in a good year where they're catching uh, banana prawns. So it's sort of out across the Gulf there. Um, and so in the analysis, it was important that we considered other things that affect prawn catch. So, you know, patterns of fishing might change year to year. Um, cyclones obviously affect fishing patterns as well. So Andrew took all of these factors in, into account um, to develop a statistical tool that connected prawn catch to river flow in particular. And what he found was there was a very strong link between banana prawn catches and river flow. So these two maps here show uh, heat maps of prawn catch on representative low flow and high flow years. So you can see that um, in general, there's catches are pretty low in years when there's low river flows and then much higher, particularly in the south, in years when there's high river flows. And so this finding wasn't particularly surprising to us because we know that from the prawns life cycle, it needs fresh water and, and previous studies have also linked catch to water flow. Um, but what Andrew did was new, we developed this statistical tool that let us quantify or measure the, the amount of flow and how many prawns that, that gives you. So that means we could use this statistical tool to predict forwards and predict the effects of dams and, and loss of water flow on prawn catch. Now, before I talk about those results, I just need to give you some important context for the North. It's a highly variable environment. You obviously have a wet season and a dry season, but any given year can be wetter or drier. Um, and so um, these graphs here show three of the major rivers there, Mitchell, Gilbert and Flinders. And the bars just show the amount of flow in any given year during the wet season. So you can see that from year to year, the flows can vary a lot. And this is this because in some years we have more cyclones and they might dump a huge amount of rainfall on a single catchment and cause a very strong flow. Whereas in other years we might have droughts. Um, so this means that your prawn catch varies a lot year to year, depending on whether it's a good or bad season for rainfall. Um, incidentally, it also means that farming will be really, really hard in the north. So some years you could have a drought um, and then you obviously want the dam to, to help your um, farming through. In other years, the farms will be totally flooded and you're probably unable to grow much at all. So for that reason, there actually aren't many investors lining up to farm in the north, but that's probably another story. Um, so Andrew looked at banana prawn catch and how this related to um, one of the proposed dams. So this graph here shows um, what he predicted the decline in catch to be under, under different types of years. So the low year is a year where we have, um, you know, not many cyclones and low river flows. And he predicted that declines in catch in those years could be up to 50%, which would obviously be a big hit for the fishery and potentially make fishing in that year unprofitable. Whereas if it's a year with very strong river flows and a lot of rainfall, uh, then um, having a dam um, is not going to impact um, the fishery as much, maybe around 10%, just because there's more water to go around. So that suggests one, might, one solution might be to, to, to mitigate the impact of dams if, if we're going to build them, um, could be allowed water through, more water to pass through in dry years uh, or allow water through, to pass through at the times when the prawns need it most. Though obviously there might be then some conflicts there with when farmers need the water most. Um, but I think the other lesson we can learn from this work is about connections between our catchment and coast and how they can really matter. So we might assume that a new development like these dams just has environmental impacts underneath its direct, direct footprint where it's built. But in this case, we found that the impacts extend all the way out into the ocean um, and it would impact one of Australia's most valuable fisheries. So we need to consider these types of linked impacts very carefully when we, when we consider new developments. Um, for instance, aside from the environmental impacts of the dam, the net economic benefits of the dam could be much smaller if we factor in the losses that the, the prawn fishery would suffer from the dam. So that brings me um, to my final case study, which is about seagrass. And seagrass is, um, this one's very complicated, I guess, because it's about conflicts between coastal development, land use change, uh, and the conservation of seagrass habitats. So before I talk more about the conflict, I just wanted to tell you a bit more about seagrass, because not, not a lot of people know about this amazing habitat and ecosystem type. 
Um, so they're really important coastal habitat. And um, unfortunately, they don't get the intention that coral reefs get, but I think they deserve it because they're just as beautiful, in my opinion, and just as important. So the usual line for why they're important is that they're food for turtles and dugongs. Um, but we want to look a bit more closely at, at, at that. So our postdoc Michael Sievers, who works for the Global Wetlands Project, looked at all different types of marine megafauna species, so including dolphins and sharks and so on, um, and whether they associate with seagrass habitats and other types of coastal vegetated habitats like salt marsh and mangroves. Um, and so this figure here just shows the percentage of, of those different animal groups that um, utilise some sort of coastal wetland habitat. And in particular for seagrass, because that's the topic today, um, we found 124 marine megafauna species globally are using seagrass in one way or another, and 48 of those are actually listed as at threat of extinction. So obviously protecting these seagrass meadows is an important part of preventing these species from going extinct because they're important habitat. Uh, and I think it's an important point to make because we often recognise the impact of habitat loss on threatened species on land, but we don't often don't appreciate that habitat loss in the ocean is also a threatening threatening uh, endangered species and, and causing extinctions. So one of my favourite examples of a seagrass loving megafauna is the bonnethead shark. Uh, <clears throat> so I don't have a picture of it today, but it's a type of, um, lives in the in the US and it's a type of hammerhead shark, but, but much smaller, the much smaller cephalofoil. Um, and it's interesting because it was only recently discovered to be the world's only omnivorous shark. So it actually eats seagrass as part of its diet. Um, so obviously for that species, looking after seagrass is, is key to having that species around. But seagrass also support many of other um, species. Um, they're also really important habitat for fisheries, like the prawn fisheries we just spoke about, um, because they provide a place for prawns to feed and they provide some structure in which the, the prawns can hide from predators. Um, yeah, so seagrass are, are just a critically important habitat for a huge range of different species. Um, and there's an interesting link back to the sharks at the start because some of those shark species can actually help seagrass meadows be more healthy. So in a, in a healthy ecosystem, we'd have large sharks like tiger sharks, um, which, are, which are trying to eat uh, dugongs and turtles that are grazing on the, on the seagrass. So where we have these tiger sharks present, it actually helps regulate the grazing and prevent overgrazing by these other species. Uh, and that can make the seagrass meadow healthier and more productive. Uh, another reason that seagrass meadows are really important uh, is that like other types of coastal vegetation like mangroves and salt marsh, they're carbon capturing superstars. So they help us fight climate change. Um, coastal wetlands like this can capture five to 35 times as much carbon from the atmosphere for the equivalent amount of tropical rainforest would capture. And another advantage they have is that they're wet, so they don't burn. Therefore, they store that carbon in, the, in their stems and in the sediment for much longer than, than rainforests will. Um, so yeah, seagrass meadows are, are really important ecosystems for a huge number of different reasons beyond just turtles and dugongs. And they're at their best in sheltered bays and estuaries. So unfortunately for them, these are the places where economic activity is the greatest and we have the greatest amounts of human activity. So where seagrass occur, we also see uh, the greatest levels of human threats. Um, and so there's obviously a lot of concern that our seagrass meadows are disappearing. In particular, they like shallow clear water um, because they need a lot of light to grow. So they're particularly sensitive to pollution that makes the water murkier. They're also sensitive to a lot of other human uh, activities um, like dredging, which stirs up sediment, makes the water murky. Um, runoff from on land and pollutants can, can uh, affect them directly and also cause diseases which cause seagrass to die off. Um, trampling by humans walking around and can also be an impact uh, and type, different types of fishing can also impact them as well. And then finally obviously when we build marinas or ports or so on that directly over seagrass that uh, is not good for them. Um, and seagrass are also quite threatened by climate change, in particular sea level rise. So we think sea level rise will start to accelerate the demise, particularly on developed coastlines, uh, like shown in this picture here of Brisbane River. Um, so this shows a, a flood plume uh, and poor water quality would affect the extensive seagrass meadows that grow in Morton Bay. But also those developed coastlines, those grey areas, um, put pressure on seagrass. Because as the water gets deeper, seagrass need to move up and, in, and inland um, so they can stay in their preferred light range on the coast. But obviously if we're armouring coasts, then we're preventing that migration. Um, and so we get they, seagrass gets squeezed out of the ecosystem and we can lose them. Um, so they're threatened by so many different pressures that it's a real challenge to manage them. 
So PhD student Laura Griffiths wanted to know um, how CRAS are going globally and whether we're doing, whether we're taking the actions that they need to protect them. So she did a very detailed review of management plans and legislation and policies relating to seagrass at a representative uh, sample of 20 locations from around the world. And what she found, unfortunately, was that was that some places, or she found first of all that most places did have plans or legislation to deal with seagrass loss, so people are thinking about the problem. But unfortunately, we generally aren't managing the right threats in the right places. Uh, I think this is really exemplified by um, a follow-up study that postdoc Viv Talek did. So she scaled up these ideas in her 2020 study, and she wanted to look at global data on threats to coastal ecosystems, which includes seagrass and other ecosystems. And the thing that she did that was was different was that um, she looked at those threats in the three general categories of, of, type, of threat types. So she looked at threats that have a marine cause like fishing, um, threats that have a cause from human activities on land like pollution or um, land use change which can cause erosion of sediments and eventually make their way out into the ocean. And she looked at threats that are caused by climate change. Uh, and so this map here shows just the percentage for each um, country in the world, marine country, shows a percentage of the threats that she found were not marine. So you can see in the, the areas in red um, are dominated by non-marine threats. So what this means is that if we're, if we're managing uh, coastal ecosystems for marine threats, we're missing a large part of the story and a large part of the processes that are threatening them. So we really need management of climate change threats and land-based threats to protect these coastal regions. Uh, and then what Viv did along with Laura was that she compared the level of each of these types of threats with the management policies that those countries had in place. Uh, and some countries were managing the right threats for what they had in action, but um, some countries weren't. So Australia um, does a pretty good job compared to other nations at addressing marine-based threats and land-based threats, so there's always room for improvement. Um, but our policies on climate change are abysmal. Um, so I'll just divert from um, seagrass for a second because I wanted to give this topical example of uh, Sydney. So you may have seen in the news that a recent storm there caused the coastline to move up 25 metres and houses were literally falling into the ocean. Um, and the problem is that we've known this has been coming for decades and the information has been there to plan for these sorts of changes, but we're not doing it. Um, and we continue to allow infrastructure development right up to the coastline. And this develop, this obviously puts human infrastructure and lives at risk if, if we have um, that right on the coast where it's susceptible to these extreme storms um, and sea level rise. Um, it's also bad for coastal ecosystems because, as I said, they get including climate change and coastal development and pollution that are threatening uh, seagrass. And so we really characterise this, this problem as um, an issue of cumulative impacts. Uh, so that's the proverbial death from a thousand cuts. So Laura also wanted to know whether management policies and plans were considering these cumulative impacts because um, it's really the accumulation of threats that's a big problem for seagrass. And what this means is that, that the policies and plans um, need to do more than assess activities, human activities on a case by case basis. So to just to give you a tangible example, imagine I wanted to build a marina um, and I did an environmental assessment. I found out it only knocks off one small core of a seagrass meadow. So I could get that approved because that impact of my one development isn't very significant. But then you come along and you want to build another marina on the other corner of seagrass meadow. Um, and yours also gets improved because again, the, the, the impact of just your development isn't that significant. But when you add up all of these cumulative effects um, and then you add in threats like climate change, then eventually we end up with no seagrass, even though there's no single person we can blame for that. Um, so the solution to that is that we have overarching uh, policies and plans that do consider cumulative impacts. And I think in Moreton Bay in, in Queensland, we're working towards that. Um, so in the 2000s, there was a lot of work to improve water quality and upgrade sewage treatment plants. Uh, and just now we're starting to see some seagrass meadows which have been missing for decades recovering again. Um, and so now in, in Moreton Bay, a, a major threat to seagrass is uh, sediment runoff from, from farming and, and land use practices that enters the rivers and, and flows out to the bay and causes the water to become more turbid and, and seagrass can't go. Um, so I just wanted to 
um, mentioned the Catchment Resilience Project that's led from the Australian Rivers Institute that, that I'm not a part of, but I think it's a really interesting project. Uh, so that's bringing together a consortium of partners, including researchers and state and local government and water utilities. And they're working to help catchments become more resilient to erosion um, and to extreme events that cause erosion like storms. Um, and um, obviously impact infrastructure too, like the floods we had in 2011. Um, and so they aim to guide investment to where actions like tree planting can have the biggest bang for buck in terms of preventing erosion and other types of pollution. And so action like this, which will benefit our freshwater ecosystems, is really important for Moreton Bay as well. In fact, um, study by um, Jack Coates Martin in 2016, um, they found that Moreton Bay is filling up with mud from our rivers. So Moreton Bay used to have these deep holes in it, um, but those are basically filled up in mud over many decades of um, mud coming from the land and, and um, flowing out into the sea. Um, and so now those deep holes are filled up, there's not much more space for more sediment coming from, from the land. So this means the next few big floods are probably going to shallow, make Moreton Bay become shallower. And this is obviously bad news for seagrass um, as they become shallower and more turbid. Um, so it's really important that we take quite rapid action to prevent erosion in rivers, both for freshwater ecosystems, but also for uh, these marine ecosystems. <clears throat> um, another thing we can do to address cumulative impacts is activate management advice so it considers the impacts of different stresses. So our PhD student Olivia King is just starting a series of experiments um, where she's looking at how the government's water quality guidelines could be modified to consider cumulative impacts of multiple pollutants. Um, so in Queensland, we monitor the, the water quality of streams and the coastal ocean for pollutants like pesticides and fertiliser that come from uh, farming. And the monitoring checks to see if water quality guidelines are exceeded, such as if the level of pesticides is above concentrations that are known to cause harmful effects to seagrass or different types of animals. Um, and then if these limits are exceeded, then this sort of triggers further follow-up action to investigate the source of pollution and perhaps take action um, such as further investment to change farming practices in that particular place. So they're quite important for informing the management actions on water quality. But the problem with the current guidelines is they don't recognise the cumulative effects of different types of pesticides or how pesticides interact with other stresses uh, like poor water quality, um, from turbidity or climate change. So what Olivia is doing in her PhD is running a whole series of experiments to determine how we could modify these trigger points uh, and protect uh, ecosystems that are threatened by multiple stresses like seagrass. So that covers my three case studies that I wanted to speak about today. And I just wanted to wrap up with two lessons from, from what I've learned from these and where I think we should go next. So the first lesson is that connections really matter to the health of ecosystems. I start at the top of the food chain with sharks and then work my way down through prawns and seagrass. And all of these species are connected through the habitat that seagrass provides for prawns, um, fish and mega, mega herbivores, and the effects that sharks have on, on preventing overgrazing and benefiting seagrass growth. Um, and connections between the land and sea also matter. So we can't just manage coastal ecosystems by creating protected areas uh, on the coast. We have to think about the effects of climate change and the effects of land use change and pollution on land. So basically we need to think about the bigger picture. And then my second lesson is the values we have for the coast are often in conflict, sometimes without us even realising it. So for instance, we saw that um, our values for having productive fisheries um, and productive farmland can be in conflict if these dams are going to impact the fisheries. Uh, so, um, you know, it's really important that we have science to, to show these connections so that we can make more informed decisions and actually realise that that there's going to be long term impacts of this dam beyond um, just freshwater ecosystems. So how can we better manage these connections and ecosystems to avoid these unwanted conflicts? Um, well, first of all, we obviously need science to measure these connections because some connections matter more than others and we have to know when, where and, and how they matter. Uh, and we need to know when seemingly independent values like fisheries and farming um, we have that we have or it might actually be in conflict. And so this is obviously what my team is working on discovering. Uh, and then we also need effective ways of communicating these connections to, to people making decisions and to communities. This is why my colleagues and I work hard to engage with communities and managers and policy makers to ensure they have up to date knowledge um, to inform decisions. And just as an example of that, the PhD student Laura Griffiths who did the work on cumulative impacts, 
She contributed what she learned in her PhD studies to the United Nations Environment Program report um, that sets out global action we can take to protect seagrass meadows and is an important international document for uh, informing seagrass management. And also the example I gave of Olivia King, who's actually working directly with Queensland government to ensure that the, her experimental findings on, on water quality guidelines can be integrated into management decisions. So finally, what can you do? Well, I think that public debates are often phrase as an either or, such as the case of beach safety and shark conservation. But it's often not that simple and there may be effective compromises. So we should be expecting more honest discussion of these issues from the media and from our political leaders, and you can ask them to do that. Um, and it's important that we can consider the bigger picture of developments because new developments don't come without costs. So remember that marina or dam might look like it brings short term economic gains, but we need to think about the flow on effects um, downstream and ask our leaders to consider those. So I think fundamentally it's important to recognise that these types of ecological connections um, mean that the different values we hold for ecosystems are linked and so we have to fight to protect the important ones. So that's my conclusion and then just to wrap up, uh, I just want to share a few links. So if you want to know more about elements of my talk, globalwetlandsproject.org is um, the website for all the coastal wetlands work. Um, Australian Rivers Institute blog, Catchment to Coast, is a really great source of um, information about science that isn't scientific papers, so very accessible. Um, you can find me on Twitter, uh, the Australian Rivers Institute, or if you want to know more about the, some of the research I spoke about today, feel free to follow up on email. So thank you very much for your time today and, and listening to the talk. Thank you very much, Chris. Very informative. Uh, I'll put that slide back up in a second. Uh, there was an initial question around, is the presentation recorded? Yes, it is. Uh, I've put the link up there as well. It's on our impact website. So uh, where a lot of you registered through, uh, that's where the recording will go up in a second. And I'll also put those links that Chris put up so you can contact him and find out more about uh, the research they're doing, uh, all that Chris is doing, and that the Australian Rivers Institute is up to. So we have had a few questions. Please let them flow in. Uh, please give a big thumbs up to those ones you want answered. Um, but we certainly have uh, one that a lot of people are keen to find the answer to. Uh, thank you, Dan, for this question. Hi, Chris. Given your observations of prawn catch, can you comment on the limitations of the current approaches to calculating environmental flows in rivers impacted by water extraction, licenses, water takes or dams? Yeah, well, thank you for that question, Dan. Uh, so, yeah, I guess a further nuance on that on that study is it's not just about the quantity of flow, but the timing of flow. So I know that, you know, the environmental flows work they do in the Murray Darling Basin and that, but they definitely do consider those kind of um, impacts. So, you know, for certain species and um, the flow has to be timed with a key event in their life cycle. So for prawns, that's when they're just getting big enough to head out to the ocean. Um, so I think those guidelines could be modified to account for marine species. It's just a lot of them don't currently account for marine species. Just because we tend to think of freshwater ecosystem as being a different thing to an ocean ecosystem. So it's really about recognising that catchment to coast connection and that the freshwater flow is important for marine ecosystems as well. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, Next up, we have Hamish. What is the current and projected status and trends of seagrass meadows in Moreton Bay? And what are the future major threats? Oh, well, thanks Hamish for that question. Um, so, you know, we've seen some recovery recently. They did all that work in the 2000s to improve water quality through sewage treatment upgrades. Um, and then we didn't see much happening with seagrass meadows for quite a while, and, but they've just started recovering in places like Deception Bay. So that's really great news. Uh, so they are making a bit of a comeback, which is good. But then on the other hand, you know, we had this risk, as I said, of, of the bay literally filling up with mud, um, which would basically slightly make it slightly shallower, particularly inshore. And that means when it gets windy, that wind stirs up sediment and makes the water murky there again. So um, it's really important that we try and act on um, planting trees on riverbanks and preventing erosion of the riverbanks to stop that mud flowing out into the bay. Uh, and then, as I said, climate change too is um, another another key threat. So a study done a few years ago by Megan Saunders from CSIRO 
um, she had looked at how sea level rise could threaten uh, seagrass in Moreton Bay. And basically it's most threatened in places where it doesn't have space to migrate inland. So, you know, along urbanised and developed coastlines. Thanks. Back to you, Damien. Oh, thank you. The uh, you're on mute is the biggest catch cry of the year, I think. Sorry about that, everyone. Uh, this is from Vanessa. Hi, Chris. Thanks for your talk. I have a question for you. I imagine that previous to a dam construction, the government requires some kind of evaluation of impacts. If yes, would this evaluation of impacts take into consideration connectivity? Does the expected impact represent the real impact? Tricky one. Yeah. Thanks, Vanessa. I see it's Vanessa Reese, my colleague, who actually works on the Catchment Resilience Project. So nice to see you here. Um, so the in terms of the, the northern rivers and the and the, the dams there, there's been a huge amount of research done on their impacts. So they're definitely considering connectivity in, in freshwater ecosystems. Uh, you know, some of my colleagues are, are doing work on the impact on freshwater floodplains, which are you know really important for a huge range of species like barramundi and magpie geese and so on. Um, so yeah, there, there is a lot of work going into assessing the impacts of the dams beyond just the prawns. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, one of the first questions that came through from Ian. Uh, research, research by Isaac Santos has investigated the impact of burying dead post-stranded whales on beaches. Do you think that the perceived increase in shark human interactions could be related to the leaching of organic materials into the ocean and providing a concentration gradient that encourages sharks to come closer to the coastline? Yep. Yeah. yeah, so there's um so yeah, there's you know, we had these um shark uh, spikes and shark bites in particular on New South Wales north coast uh, a couple of years ago and had we've had a couple this year as well. <clears throat> Um, so there are a number of theories about why that is, why these spikes are occurring. Um, the first theory is that, you know, these events are just really rare. They're, they're really hard to predict. And so uh, there's just sort of random variation in them year to year. Uh, another theory that, that Ian has, has brought up there is that uh, when there's a dead whale that's stranded on a beach, um, uh, sharks often obviously smell that whale carcass. So in fact, that picture I showed you of the hammerhead shark brain, you can see sort of two lobes going out to the side, um, and that's the parts that uses for smell. So, you know, sharks in general have a very developed sense of smell. And so this theory has that the sharks are basically smelling these whale carcasses, which council berries uh, on the beach, and then and then um, coming close to the coast, which is more likely to bring them into contact with humans. Um, and so I know that Southern Cross Uni is doing some research on that, but I'm not sure what the findings are, sorry, and whether that research is finished yet about whether that was attracting sharks to the coast. Um, and the leading theory at the moment is that um, these spikes are occurring for a few reasons. So over time, uh, we have more and more people going in the coast, obviously as, as in the water of the coast as the as population density increases. And we have more people engaging with the coastal ocean in, in a huge variety of different ways. You know, people used to go swimming just in a few places and now we have people surfing and, and so on. So that just means we're more likely to encounter sharks. Um, another reason is that um, climate change and, and there's also year on year change in currents. So some years we have warmer currents uh, on the east coast and this can bring sharks closer to shore as they follow fish that are moving closer inshore and so that could increase rates of encounters of people uh, inshore too. And there's probably a bit of a climate, climate connection there too but, but sort of is a bit more speculative um, that as the climate warms then we, we might see these, coast, these sharks actually moving in closer to the shore. So it's not that there's more sharks, it's just that sharks are more likely to encounter people for a number of reasons. But yeah, I think the um, the whale carcass one is still being followed up on. Thank you. Question? Yes, uh, I think so. And as, as I mentioned, uh, we'll share out the uh, links to Chris so you can um, get a hold of him on Twitter or email to um, follow up on any of these questions. Uh, another question has come in from Dan. I'd be keen to hear what your PhD student, um, perhaps Olivia, feels about the multiple lines of evidence approach in the newish ANZG 2018 water quality guidelines. 
Uh, does it deal with the complexities of cumulative impacts to seagrass? All right, thanks, Dan. I'd have to hand over to Olivia for that one. So um, maybe if you email me, I can put you in touch with her. She's the expert. She's actually um, she's doing experiments, but she also works in um, government assessing water quality guidelines. So she's the real expert on that topic. All right. Uh, that was a nice palm off by Chris. <laughs> I see there's one from Jacinta about seagrasses. Uh, Jacinta, yes. Uh, just wondering how seagrasses reproduce. Is it predominantly vegetative? I wonder, have you seen them in flower? Yep, so I've, I've never been, so they, they flower rarely uh, in general, and I've never been lucky enough to see one flower, and the flowers are, are quite small and, and hard to spot, so you have to be there at the right time and, and really know what you're looking for. So yeah, primarily they're reproducing vegetatively through the shoots growing out um, and then they expand across the seafloor. Um, but flowering and seeds is also important, particularly for longer distance dispersal. So, you know, the seeds will float and travel longer distances. Um, and there's some great work coming um, from uh, Lana Gretsch's lab. Uh, I think she's at, um, in New South Wales now, but she's been doing some great work on seagrass connectivity on the Great Barrier Reef that's worth looking at. So they've been looking at um, how seagrass might decline, but also recover through this dispersal of seeds from different places. So it's really that network of meadows that helps give the system resilience to disturbances. If one meadow happens to you know, have a die off and we lose it, then that seed dispersal is important for its recovery. Thank, thank you for that one. Uh, another question has come in with a few thumbs up. Uh, do you see much beach driving? Do you see how beach driving affects seagrass on banks? Um, I, have, I mean, I've, I've, yeah, I can't say I've witnessed particularly people driving on seagrass meadows. I don't think that would be allowed in Queensland. Um, that, but yeah, it would definitely be bad for the seagrass meadow because it would it would crush the seagrass, but also um, cause erosion. And in general, beach beach driving is pretty bad for our beach ecosystems, which are really under-recognised ecosystems. So there's a lot of small shells and crabs and things that live in the sand, and and beach driving basically crushes them. So. Um, a lot of our beaches on the Queensland coast where, where four-wheel driving is allowed are allowed are far more compacted than they should be and, and don't have the same diversity of um, these you know, shells and crabs that they would have. And they're obviously an important part of the food chain and, and feed a huge range of different bird species and fish in particular. So, yeah, I'm not sure about the seagrass though. One of the, one of the key, I guess, human threats, sort of recreational threats to seagrass in Queensland uh, is pumping for sandworms. So people go out and uh, pump for sandworms to use in fishing. And if you do that in seagrass, it kills that patch of seagrass meadow. So, you know, one person doing it's okay, but if you have a lot of people going out to a meadow and pumping for worms in there, then it can w eventually wipe out the meadow. Yeah, I think there's uh, something, you know, there's always more research to do, isn't there, Chris? Yeah. <laughs> uh, another question has come in from Ben. Hi Chris, I like the focus on Australian ecosystems, but wondered to what degree does your research and findings apply to different Australian and coastal systems in other parts of the world? Oh, thanks for asking that question, Ben. I, uh, I, don't, know, I don't know where to start with that one. Um, the, so the Global Wetlands Project is a global project, so I, I didn't talk a lot about that work, but um, we're working with partners. So definitely, yeah, it, it does apply in other parts of the world. We're working with partners in Hong Kong and um, the Sundarbans, you know, one of the world's biggest mangrove forests in uh, India and Bangladesh. Um, we're also working uh, with people in South Africa, and, and so um, yeah, we're definitely trying to apply some of these um, findings for how you map the health of, of coastal ecosystems and cumulative impacts to other parts of the world. Uh, and then I've also had a few years ago I worked on a really nice project in Fiji where we're looking at ridge to reef management, uh, and Fiji is great there because. Um, people have sort of traditional tenure over the land and sea, so it's sort of much easier to do a catchment, catchment to coast management project because it's the same people that are managing the land as is managing the you know, coastal seagrass meadows and coral. So, um, yeah, some, some good work there that I can tell you more about if, if you want to get in touch. Uh, but that was with the Wildlife Conservation Society who works a lot in Fiji. Thanks uh, for that question. Yeah, I love talking about the international work. Uh, this is from Jacinta, and I'm hoping it's a follow-up um, and not a Star Wars question. So, so are they clones? I'm believing this is talking about seagrass and flowering. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, a lot of seagrass meadows are clones, yep. 
And uh, my colleague Rod Connolly, who, who directs the Global Wetlands Project, he did a really nice study, and hopefully I get this right, in Moreton Bay, where he looked at the genetic diversity of seagrass meadows. So then you can tell whether the meadow is one big clone or lots of um, individual, uh, you know, different individuals of different genotypes. Um, and what he found, what was interesting, is that the ones that were more genetically diverse were also better at recovering from disturbances like floods. So that's just because you have a, you know, a greater variety of different genes, and so they're more likely, if there's a flood, to have um, a type of seagrass there that's able to recover from that particular disturbance. So yeah, um, that genetic diversity is important for their survival and recovery. Okay, and we have our final question. Uh, great present, this is from an anonymous question. Great pr presentation, Chris. Will you be presenting your finding, the findings of all your research to the media to help influence change in general society perceptions of sharks, et cetera? Yeah, so I, I mean, it's the, one of the, I guess, privileges you get as a scientist when you publish a study uh, is that you can release that to the press. And then that, I guess, it, I, in my mind, it, it helps spur public conversation about some of these issues. Um, and of course, there's a lot of public interest in sharks. So whenever we publish a shark study, there's usually a lot of media. And um, so the last one I published on tiger sharks last year, I spent a lot of time doing radio interviews and TV interviews and so on about shark declines, but also shark bites. Um, so it is, it's definitely, the research is definitely a good opportunity to help further that conversation about sharks in, in the public space and, and talk about some more of the nuances as, rather than framing it as a sharks versus people debate. So yeah, thanks for that question. Thank you very much, Chris. That brings us to the end of the uh, Q&A section. Uh, I really thank Chris for his time and, and putting together his presentation and, and the thought and knowledge that went into it and for taking um, a thoughtful response to, to all those questions. Um, we can't do a round of applause anymore in this virtual environment, so it's a bit hard, but I, I really do thank you. And um, I will be putting up the presentation after the event at the impact site. I've left the link up there on the question and answers. And also I will add um, Chris's details through Twitter and email and the websites and blogs so we can get in contact with him and find out more about uh, the research he's doing and, and the, the whole of the Australian Rivers Institute is undertaking. There's some really fascinating stuff. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. I'll just put you up on the screen one last time. <laughs> So cheers and thank you and we'll um, no doubt see more of you in the future. And yes, Chris is also one of our great uh, media people that we'll find um, on many channels and producing lots of different content for different audiences. So, oh, I'll just, so that's, uh, so thank you very much everyone for attending uh, this evening's event. I'd just like to draw your attention to our next event that is happening in late August. Uh, Cybersecurity, a global responsibility. Avoid being the weakest link with Associate Professor Muthu. Uh, this will be another um, Teams live event. Uh, and uh, Muthu is from our School of Information and Communication Technologies. He's a cybersecurity expert. And he'll be talking about how the reference to the weakest link is it's, it's the weakest chain is the one that um, lets in the hackers or, or the bad people in cybersecurity and talking about how you know we are all responsible from individuals to companies and even to nations as uh, we try and tackle cybersecurity. So it should be an interesting one. You will be able to find the link through to um, register for that one on the impact site as well. As I mentioned at the start of the uh, presentation this evening, uh, this presentation is part of National Science Week and if you'd like to find out more about National Science Week at Griffith University please head along to the link on the screen now. Uh, there's lots of different activities for schools, primary and secondary, as well as new podcasts and um, other presentations. So head along there. Uh, I'd also like to draw your atten attention to our open house. So as I mentioned at the top, open house is our 12 week long open day. Uh, you can actually visit us at any time of the day, uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the next uh, eight weeks, I believe. 
and collect information if you're thinking about studying with Griffith University. But uh, for the next hour this evening and every Tuesday and Thursday from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m., uh, our booths are actually staffed by real live humans. So you can ask them questions and uh, really dig down into any of your interest areas. So if you're thinking about studying marine biology or biochemistry and following in Chris's footsteps, you can head along there and find out a little bit more information uh, and and oops, and you can head along to there. You need to register to get in, but there are lots of presentations. And um, next week on Tuesday, we've actually got a presentation by an alumni of Griffith University, uh, Dr. Jessie Christensen, who now works with NASA. Um, she's an exoplanetary scientist. So she's dialing in from LA and will be giving a presentation uh, next Tuesday. So there's lots of things happening. Please head along there if you are interested and want to find out more about studying at Griffith University. I thank you very much for your time. I'll put up those links very soon and uh, I wish you a good night.